Hello and a very warm welcome to this week's Super 6 podcast. It's myself, Laura Woods, and usually I'd be saying hello to Mr. Bio Akinfemwa, but yet again, he's managed to skip the podcast. Um, he plays more for Wiccan than he does actually appear in this podcast, which I know is quite hard to believe. Uh, so what we've done, um, I can't call him a super sub. I can call him super something, but he's definitely not a super sub. He's more than that. It's Mr. Super Ali McCoy. Hello to Ali. Laura, how are you? Listen, you can call me anything like you normally do. And I don't mind being a substitute for that great man. I'm really looking forward to this. I've got to say, how are you getting on? Oh, very well. It's essentially like for like, isn't it? It is. It's, it's very much. The only, the only difference now, I've got to say to you, the only difference is you're actually smaller in this screen than you are in my morning one on, on TalkSport Breakfast. I've got you bigger on that one. So you've, you've cut <laughs> well, down in size. That's the only difference. This is, this is really weird for me. I don't know how you feel about it, but normally we've been meeting at 12 hours ago. So so essentially what we're doing is is we're meeting in after hours, TalkSport. It's, it's kind of like we're allowed to say all sorts of things on this. We're probably allowed to swear. I mean, we won't just in case, but it does feel like a kind of after hours, isn't it? It really does. I must admit, though, I, I'm looking forward to it um, because first and foremost, brilliant guests coming on who will be right up my street. I can't tell you how such, excited such I am. Guess. Clearly, such a good oh, I know. I think, I think it's safe to say... The majority of the, the listeners will know which team I'll be, I, I support and used to play for. So I can't tell you how excited I am to have our guest on. Yeah, absolutely. We do indeed have a Celtic player on just for Ali. Just joking. <laughs> <laughs> how dare you? How dare you? <laughs> So this week's guest, of course, will be feeling like he's probably flying still. Um, they've won the Scottish Premiership. Um, he has a big part to play in that. We're very, very excited to meet him. So let's go for it. This week's guest is ready to join us. And uh, Rangers fans will be very, very excited about this one because not only do we have Sir Ali McCourt, it's the absolute legend. I just knighted him. We are now joined by Kemar Ruth. Hello to Kemar. How are you doing? Hi, Kemar. Yeah. Hello, hello. I'm good, thank you, yourself. Oh, very, can... very well. The first thing I want to do is A, congratulate you on the title, but also, more importantly, congratulate you on that top you're wearing. <laughs> that, that top's of a vintage I can relate to, my friend. Yeah, I heard you were coming on, so I thought, let me, let me wear appropriate attire just for you. That is brilliant. What year is that? Just explain to the listeners that there's no that need, can't there's see no it. To, there's no need to divulge years or anything like that, would you? <laughs> Kemar Kema has done fantastically well. <laughs> 1993, my year of birth. Oh, no, you just did him dirty there. You did. You didn't even mean to, but you did. <laughs> I don't care. I don't care. <laughs> it, it's an um, iconic papa. I had to get one. Oh, it looks great. Well, look, Kema, we are... I, I want to ask you, first of all, if I may, tell me how you're feeling after, when that news came through that Celtic had drawn the game up at Tanadice, you know, it must have been incredible. I, I, I'm led to believe that you were actually at the training ground. Is that true? Yes, we were at the training ground, supposed to be doing a recovery session um, <laughs> with, with the game in the background. Um, but it, it was a perfect moment. Everyone's there. Watching the game, um, now I kind of understand how it feels to be a fan, watching. But it was strange because I was watching the game, but I had no connection towards the other teams. But I wanted a certain result um, <laughs> and we got the result, so it was amazing. Obviously, it had been coming because this season, you and the team have just been incredible. And under Steven Gerrard, it all seems to be clicking uh, and clicking really well. So when it did happen in that way and you weren't on the pitch and you celebrated, when you're looking around at your teammates, what's that feeling like? Yeah, it's very strange because it felt like someone else was winning you the league. Whereas a lot of the players, a lot of us wanted Celtic to win that game. So then we could actually win the league ourselves by playing them the following week. So it, it, was, it was a strange moment. Kemar, I was going to say to you, um, looking at the level of performances throughout the year, at this stage to go through the league campaign and have the have the league won 
undefeated. Yeah. I mean, I've got to say, at, at the start of the season, Kemar, I was I was very, very hopeful and optimistic that the boys could do it. But the yeah. way that the way that you've done it, frankly, has been absolutely fantastic, remarkable. You know, to I think the boys have, including the draw at the weekend, they're right in saying five draws and every other one victories. Yeah, exactly. And a lot of those draws, the gaffer wasn't happy, the players weren't happy. Um, those draws felt like losses. So that I think that in itself just shows the sort of demands we have on each other um, and what we wanted to achieve this season. Yeah, it's like high standards. That's that's the great thing about that, I think. Yeah. Does, does that come in? Obviously, as a footballer, you have high standards anyway, but is that something that, that Steven Gerrard is, is very big on? Yeah, definitely. It, come, it, it, it comes from the gaffer. Um, he's naturally like that. When he was a player, he was like that. So he was naturally going to bring it as a manager. Um, he's been at the club this is his third season so each year he's been building to bring in players with that same mentality and I think we've got a dressing room um, where everyone has the same mentality to win we want to win even in training we have to win so come on we'll go through winning the Scottish Premiership for the first time in what stopping Celtic for doing it for what 10 years on the bounce which is just incredible in, its, in itself and we'll talk about what Steven Gerrard is like a manager and your team spirit but before we get into all of that um, it has been quite a difficult couple of weeks for you hasn't it with, with everything that's happened talk us through first of all uh, the collision that happened in, in Europe um, and how you felt about that yeah like you said it, the well you might as well say the last few weeks has been crazy because We've gone from winning the league um, with an excitement, like a party type of excitement, to a few days later we have to focus because we've got a massive Europa League game. Um, so the ability to switch for, um, mindset from having fun to being focused again to start winning things was a challenge. Um, and we, We've done that and we managed to get a, a decent result, 1-1 one, one at their place. And then the following week at our place, it went to dis disappointment from, from losing. And also then it, it switched the anger with the different things that were happening in the game, which is, is not acceptable. Um, but I think a lot of it did stem from my tackle. Um, it, it, it looks bad. It, 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 it is bad for the for the goalkeeper. Um, it hurt him a lot, but it was not on purpose at all. Um, I I, I, re I was receiving a ball from Connor Goldson, a, a ball over the top, and especially at the speed that we play at, you, you can't you can't move out the way or you can't um, prevent things from happening. And it was literally a a bad. Um, a bad accident. Mm. How do you feel that when, when that happened? Because naturally, I mean, a lot of the blame will obviously fall at your feet because they'll say, look, it, it's your fault and, and for whatever reason, because you're right when you stop it and when you watch it as a as a photo rather than, you know, real time as, as it's actually happening, it, it does look bad. So so how does that feel for you? Because because you obviously sitting there going, God, I, I didn't mean to do this. I wouldn't, I wouldn't deliberately hurt anybody like that. Mm -hmm. No, of course. People that know me, they know I'm, I'm, I'm not that type of player or even person. I never go on the pitch to think I need to have a fight or to hurt somebody. All I want to do is play well, help the team win games. Um, and that's what I was trying to do. I was on the bench, itching to get on, especially as a striker, you itching to get on. You want to you wanna make a difference. You want to help the team win the game. And soon as I saw the ball coming over from Connor, I thought, this is a good chance for me to get in here. I um, I managed to look across the line and and see that I I was onside, unmarked, and then my eyes went back on onto the ball, and the ball bounced extremely high, a bit too high for my head, so I had to try and reach for it with my foot. I managed to get there first and get a touch on the ball, and obviously my follow through collided with the keeper because he was running straight at me. Um. At, at the time, I didn't realise my foot landed on his on his face um, because he, obviously, we both landed on the floor. He landed 
on his front covering his face and then only until he rolled over I started seeing the blood um, obviously your first impressions you, you, you feel bad you, that's why you, you're walking up the pitch you feel bad because you've you've hurt a fellow professional footballer and you don't mean to do it but it, like I said it was it was an accident it was I got to the ball first and the keeper collided with me um, there's nothing I could have done about it Okay, man, I've got to say to you, mate, it was exactly how I called it at the time and exactly what I said in the radio the following morning. There's absolutely no doubt it was just it was just a terrible accident. It was as simple as that because I saw exactly what happened. The ball came over your shoulder. You lifted your yeah. foot up to get the ball and, un- and it was a very, very unfortunate collision. I'd won myself, Kemar, um, many years ago, yeah. very similar where I was up at Petaudry at Aberdeen and, and the pitch was very wet and the ball came across and I slid in and unfortunately, um, because of the, the pitch was, was was very slippery and wet, I slid and my knee went into the goalkeeper's jaw and his face and he actually he had a compressed and yeah. depressed fracture of, 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 of his jaw effectively um, and it was just a complete horrible accident. And I and and I could I could feel your pain because it actually took me back to that moment how bad that I felt. I knew in my heart of hearts, I knew one hundred percent, my friend, it was a complete accident. But you still felt bad for the goalkeeper, and at that moment, I could feel your pain. Yeah, it's when you watch the video back, you you can see I'm clearly watching the ball. Um, never once. Well, at the start, obviously, I knew where the keeper was. I knew he was a bit off his line. But after that, and my eyes were back on the ball, I never once looked back at the goalkeeper. I won the ball first. Um, and then, obviously, I collided with the keeper. But, obviously, with the the photos that everyone is seeing, they're only seeing me land on the goalkeeper. But they're never seeing me win the ball first. So, naturally, everyone's going to think, yeah, Maybe he's done it on purpose. It, it, it's really terrible. Something like this should never happen in the game. But they never shown the pictures of me winning the ball or touching the ball first, um, which is a bit unfair for, on, on my part. Kemma, you said a minute ago as well, you were talking about what happened on the pitch and, and, and everything else that boiled over. Um, those comments that were made and... Um, I've listened to Stephen Gerrard in his post-match interview as well. I've, I've, I've listened to what he says on it. And um, ultimately, Glenn Kamara um, is saying he was racially abused on the pitch. Um, it didn't just finish on the pitch as well. I know that you received racial abuse on social media as well afterwards. Yeah. How difficult is this uh, for you to take in a, in a game that you play because you love it and it's your profession and you feel now, I imagine, that you're still subjected to, to racial abuse in the year 2021? No, yeah, it's unacceptable. First, on the pitch, I, d- I just don't know what goes through people's heads to even think about doing it. Um, and regarding Glenn Kamara, he's not someone that's going to make it up or react in a way um, unless it's really needed. Um, so he's not going to make it up. Plus, what I've, I've been getting on social media, I've, I'm still getting it now. Still today, if I was to post a picture, I think a vid- I posted a video yesterday and you read all the comments and I'm still getting all the emojis, all the words now. I go into my messages on Instagram. I'm getting tons and tons of messages now. Um, so I'm not sure when it's actually going to stop for me personally. Um, but it's, it's, what, what can I do? I can't do anything. Um I'm not going to not go on social media because well, I want to use can, it. I can only imagine, because I don't know what it's like, but I'm, I'm, I'm very, very hopeful that you know that there's a lot more people, a lot more people with you than against you. That's for sure. And I, I obviously follow you, and, and I was saying to the guys earlier on, you put a brilliant post up. I don't know whether it was today or yesterday. And there was a photograph of yourself and Scott Brown, the Celtic captain. And I saw it and I, I thought it was a, a great post. And you said there's some big games of football, effectively along these lines, and there's, there's none more important than the Rangers Celtic game, you said. Mm-hmm. But some things are even more important than that. 
And I thought it was a brilliant post, my friend. Yeah, it's true because obviously in the football world, everyone loves people. People love football. It's it's, it's for some people it's more important than family or or anything. They live, breathe football. But there's a bigger world than just the football world, and also the, the last season, the whole coronavirus. I think that put everything in perspective because. We couldn't play football anymore because there was something that was more important than football. So I think that opened, especially opened my eyes up because sometimes you think in in the so-called football world, you're untouchable, it's safe, um, we can do things a bit differently. But no, yeah. there's still things out there like Corona, like racism, that are a, a lot more important than football. Mm. Myself and Ali have these discussions um, on the breakfast show that we do together um, about what should be done and and how to deal with this. And um, we spoke about this the other day with Troy Deeney, actually. And and I was saying to Troy, I don't know whether footballers almost feel like they've they've done enough. They've done all that they can. Like, what more can you guys do? We, we were talking about taking the knee or standing as well. I know that's something that, that you guys have talked about too. Um, whether or not you, got, you kind of feel it's out of our hands now. It has to be the authorities in football and the authorities in social media as well and in society that, that are the ones that can actually make change. Yeah, exactly. It's the, it's the people that are in charge. The people that run UEFA, they have to do something about it. They have to punish the people that are doing it. Otherwise, nothing's going to change. Um, social media owners, they need to control what they've, they've created. A, I don't even, a, an absolute machine. You can use it for good or you can use it for evil, but they need to control it and manage it. And it's too easy for people to go on social media and abuse someone else. There's a lot of importance about mental health. Some people can't handle the comments that I'm getting. Um, luckily for myself, I can kind of ignore it and go about my business, but there's a lot of people out there that can't do that. To receive comments every day abusing you, something needs to be done by the social media owners. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Um, let's talk to you about something that you really love, and that is football. Um, because I think you know we've got you on, and and obviously we wanted to talk to you about those things, and and we thank you for talking about them because we can't even begin to imagine how that feels. Yeah. Um, because I've never been racially abused at, at all. Um, I've never been um subject to anything because of the color of my skin. So I can't imagine it, let alone trying to do my job and and be abused for the color of my skin in that sense. Um, so I feel like actually we we stop giving them airtime and we focus on on your career and what you've done and how you've got to this point. Um, because we've got so much to get through. Um, you started off at West Brom, two thousand eleven. What were your early days like there? It, it was it was good. It was mixed. It was good. Um, I started when I was six, and oh, no, the West Brom Academy to learn football is very good. It's tactically, technically, um, physically, mentally, they teach you everything, everything you need to know. Um, but the the difficult bit was when you get to that stage of you're too old for academy football, but then you need to break into first team. And I think that's that's the bit where I struggled with and I, and I started to dislike um, that time of my career. Kemma, I was going to say to you, I, I, I'm looking at you, obviously looking at the times you had at, at West Brom, and there's a couple of things I never knew about you. For example, you went out and loan a few times. Yeah. You know, you, you went out to, I think you went to Wreckham, Northampton Town, Cheltenham, Colchester, Oxford. Yeah. To me, I think that's fantastic because you wanted to go out and experience not only different different football teams, eight different football teams and different types of football, but also you weren't scared to try different countries either. No. Yeah, no, it's right. For me, I... I like change. I'm not scared of change and I can adapt. But I also 
want to succeed. So if I'm not succeeding somewhere here, I need to think about going somewhere else to do it. Um, like I said, at the time at West Brom, I was doing so much in the academy system and I didn't feel like I was, I was improving anymore, could go any further because I don't think I was getting that chance to go into the first team. So yeah. therefore I needed to find first team football somewhere else to be able to prove myself, not, well, yes, yeah, show everyone what I can do. Um, but sometimes certain teams or certain moves aren't always good for you. Sometimes they don't work out. Um, and I think some of those low moves didn't. But I also, I don't regret them either because I learned a lot from each and each one of those low moves. Which ones do you feel did work out for you and which ones didn't? Um, Oxford worked out for me. <laughs> well, let's talk about Oxford then, um, because you won League Two. You were P- PFA Player of the Year that year as well. So it didn't just work out; it worked out very well. <laughs> yeah, it did because the that uh-huh. pre- the pre- the previous season for that one when we got promoted, um, I think for six weeks I, I was actually on loan to Oxford then, and then the following season I signed permanently. So that that loan move set me up for the following season to sign there permanently and kick on. And I think Oxford was the place where I was able to make a name for myself um, and to be allowed to express myself. Kemar, I I was just looking because um, your goal ratio at Oxford that year was excellent, mate. I mean, I I think, unless I'm mistaken, it was about 18 and 40. Was that the first period in your career where well, you must have really felt good about yourself and enjoyed your football and think, thinking to yourself, you know, I'm going to score goals every game here. Yeah, because like I said, before I signed there permanently, I was on loan for six weeks and I think that the last seven, the last seven games of that season, I must have scored six goals. So then I, w- I had that good feeling, ready to go into the next season. Um, and... I kind of had like a, a bit of a pressure on me because I was I was signing there with a bit of an expectation that I need to do well for for the club and for myself. Um, but I kind of I, I like that because I, I believe in myself. I know what I can do, um, and also I had the the players around me to allow me to to get the best out of myself to play the football that I need to play. Um, I was. I think I was. I played a lot of that season on the left wing, yeah, left le- left midfield, um, and then the other occasions I was allowed to go down the middle as a as a as a ten. So I was able to get some goals, and I enjoyed it. Tell us about the interest from Leeds and when that started, because you're playing for Rangers now, and obviously that's a huge fan base, and and Leeds is another one of those giant fan bases. Yeah, well, to be fair, one of the reasons I did sign at Oxford was be Michael Appleton, the manager. He he helped me so much, and he understood um, my journey and where I wanted to to get to. And when I signed, I I, I told him I want I want to be I want to go to the Premier League. I want to keep going up the leagues um, as quick as possible. And he said, Yeah, that's fine because. If you play well and get the interest, it means you're playing well for Oxford, so we're going to do well. So it, it all it all works for each other. And he allowed me um, to move. And, and he, plus, he also he, he helped me. He, he knew the teams that were interested and he, he helped me decide which one to choose. Kim, that, that's what I want to ask you for me. When did you find out, first of all, about Leeds' interest? And was your head ever turned about the possibility of going somewhere else? Or did you think immediately, Leeds is the place for me? Well, I, I knew about some interest in January. So, say I played the six months at Oxford. I was getting interest in January. Um, but Mike Appleton said, no, it's not happening in January. We, we need you. We, we need to get promoted. So it's not happening. 
But at the end of the season, <laughs> at the end of the season, it's a different story and we can sit down and I, I will help you choose where you want to go. But January, it's not happening. And for me, I understood that because at the start of the season, I had two two aims. I want, and I told Mike Upperton as well, I wanted we wanted to get promoted as a team. And individually, I wanted to be the best player in the league as well. And so I, my mind was already set from the from the, st- the start of the season that promotion, best player of the league. And to be best player of the league and promote, promotion, I needed to play the full season. So I didn't mind going anywhere in January because um, I knew if I kept doing what I needed to do, end of season, interest will still be there. And it, it was. Tell us about uh, the early days at Leeds then, because it was a little while, wasn't it, before you really hit your form and it took a while for you to score. That must have been quite difficult. And then eventually when you got into scoring, what, what was it that you think clicked for you? I think the big part was my position. I, I went to Leeds and I kept getting played left wing. Um, and that first season was very defensive minded. Um, and I found it very difficult to adjust for that for that formation, that style of play in that position. Because really all I wanted to do was go forward and create, have a bit of a free role like I was having at Oxford. But at Leeds, I had to play a set position. I had to be very regimented. Um, that season, I got a lot of assists, but my goals weren't good at all I think I only scored three that season and it took me a a long time to get that first goal and I don't know if I was maybe trying too hard to score um, which I think Ali you'd know as a striker especially when you've come from a season where you scored freely and now all of a sudden you're not scoring but you're assisting a lot you want to score especially at a big club like Leeds can I ask you, Kemma, <clears throat> briefly then, what, where would you, if you had a choice, because I know Stephen and Rangers play with the three up front and I've, I've seen you play in the right, I've also seen you play through the middle and I've also seen you play in the left and you played them yeah. all well. Yeah. Do you prefer in any specific position? And for example, do you like having, do you like having a striking partner? Could you, would you enjoy a 4-4-2, for example? Yeah, it's a, it's, I get asked this question a lot and it's hard for me to to give a, a straightforward answer because growing up, I was always put out on the left-hand side, left wing, because even though I'm right-footed, I could use my left foot. And, and you, you know, in a lot of teams, there's not a lot of left-footed players. Mm. So it was, okay, you can use your left foot so you can go on the left-hand side. Even though really deep inside, I was a goal scorer. But because of my height and size, I was always overlooked as a number nine striker. So I always got pushed to the side and said, go and play on the wing because you're not as tall or you're not as big. So that's why everyone, or they used to see me as a winger, even though really in my head I was a number 10, I was a number nine because I could score goals or create goals. Um, so I learned how to play out wide. Um, but Really, I'm I'm a, I'm a player that to get the best out of me, play down the middle, um, because y- you get more options to be able to f- go wherever you want. Then you get more of a freedom to to roam. Um, I don't like to be tied down into one position, like as if it's the beauty of football. I don't like that. <laughs> That's a good way of describing it. Yeah, that 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 must be frustrating because yeah. essen- essentially you're being in your uh, punished might be too hard a word, but you know what I mean. You're you're being punished for being versatile. Yes, it is, but also, <laughs> also, I was I think I was being punished because I wasn't the biggest. Mm. That's what it was to start with. I wasn't I wasn't the biggest. Yeah. There was there were bigger players than me in my age group growing up, so they suited the coach more as a number nine than me. So then I, I had to play the the long the long game and I had to wait for my time to then eventually get played as a number nine or as a ten and then prove that I can actually do it. And that took that took halfway through the second season at Leeds to show I can actually play as a number nine by myself. And that was only because 
Um, Chris Wood got a, a move to Burnley, and also the another striker we had got injured. So then we had no number nine. So then I got I just got pushed as a number nine because we had no one else to play there. Kimmer, can I ask you? Please tell me. I, I, I'm interested to know what do you think of this current lead side under Bielsa because. Laura and I talk most mornings and and I just love watching them. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter who the opposition is. I just love their style of play and I love their attitude to play. And I think they've been a breath of fresh air this year. Yeah, no, they have. Definitely. I love watching them play, even though mm. I get nervous watching because I don't know what's going to happen. But you know, <laughs> you know, it's going to be entertaining. <laughs> That's exactly it, isn't it? You, you, it could be you could see ten goals. Although the other day did, there was a nil nil draw, and we were like, "What? That's a bit weird." Like when? Yeah. When was the last time they were involved in a nil nil draw? Oh, it's mad, isn't it? Uh, talking about lots of goals, um, I want to take you back to Boxing Day 2018. So you're playing Blackburn. Um, they believed they'd scored a last minute winner, um, and then you came along, scored goals in the 91st minute and then the 94th minute, um, and completely ruined it for them. Just tell us about your memories of that day. I think that's one of the days I'll never forget in football. That was it was unbelievable. As as um, scoring a goal anyway, that feeling is can't beat it. But then when it's drawing a comeback, when we need to win at home, um, last minute, poof, yeah, it was it was it was crazy. Even you just watch I watch the videos um, now and again of that goal and. The celebrations, the whole, all the, all, all of our players were just running in different directions, <laughs> just with emotions. It was, it was tough. That's and then I think the, the week after we had Villa, and <laughs> it was a last minute goal at Villa as well, and it was unbelievable scenes again. I've got to say, you take me back. I, I, you talk about the emotion of, of those goals, Kemal. Right? I've seen you score two goals this season. That. I'll never forget, never mind you forgetting, mm. both, of them, well, both of them in Europe. I mean, absolutely. I know I'm jumping away from Leeds United, but we're talking about goals here. I mean, incredible, absolutely incredible. Tell me, first of all, the, the, the one that you've had from the halfway line, I'm doing the commentary in the game and I'm looking at the clock and I see you knock it round the defender and I'm <laughs> saying to myself, good, take it to the corner. Take it to the corner, yeah. and then all of a sudden you had other plans, mate. <laughs> yeah, other plans. Yeah, and it was. Yeah, but the, the the thing is, the amount of times I've tried to score that type of goal, it's it's it's, it's a lot. Whether that's in training or whether that's in in games, but you only remember when it actually goes in. So I'm 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 pleased with that. Um, I think the following season when I was. Previous season when I was at Anderlecht, Vincent Company used to literally go crazy at us. Everyone shooting outside the box, and he's like, "Stop! Everyone, stop shooting outside the box!" <laughs> because there's um, he he had a, a chart where like the percentage of uh, goals scored on the pitch, and the highest percentage of goals are always scored inside the box. So he was like, "Anybody." Got the ball outside the box, no shooting. Only shoot inside the box. That's coming from Vincent Company. Yeah, he's one of the yeah. best goals outside the box. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I think as a manager, it, it, it must be frustrating when you, you play the shooting and the ball's going up in the stand and you just wasted wasted an attack. So I can get where he was coming from, but for me, it was like no, I need I need to. I, you, when you feel feel the chance to shoot, you just have to take it sometimes. And it, it's, I don't know, it's, it's, I can't explain it. It's, it just happens, it's spur the moment. I'm sure Ali knows exactly what you're talking about. Um, I'm going to bring you back to Leeds, if you don't mind, because um, we do have a minor Bielsa obsession on this podcast. It's been known. Uh, not just this podcast, also myself and Ali. Pretty pretty sure anyone I work with actually feels the same way I do about um, Marcelo Bielsa. Tell us about the, the, the last couple of games that you had for Leeds. Um, the playoff semi-final against Derby. Um, you scored the winner, then you missed the second leg through injury. How hard was that to, to miss, especially with what happened after and the kind of resulting missing it? Yeah, I know. It's, it's, it's been a, a, a problem of mine. I keep 
doing really well. And then I end up getting some form of niggle or injury to, to kind of stop my progression to keep the momentum going. And obviously we just missed out on automatic promotion that season, which was difficult to take. But then we all regrouped and we got together and we just said final push it for the playoffs we can we can still do this and we showed it in the first leg we we went their place I managed to get a goal um, so everyone was happy we, and then we was ready for the next game <clears throat> and it, I just knew there was, there, there was a tightness in, in my leg and I, I knew it, it wasn't going to be good um, I kept telling everybody I'll be fine I'll be fine but in, in the back of my head I kind of knew it was. It wasn't going to be, and it was very disappointing because y- y- you don't want to be missing these big games. This is why you play football to 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 compete in these big games to to to, to show how how good you are or or get that bit of glory for yourself, for the team, for the for the club, especially for a club like Leeds as well that demands so much and deserves so much as well. And I thought this was our chance to to achieve something massive. Kimmer, tell me a little bit about that. How do you handle that personally? Because for for non-sports people that perhaps don't play sport, it would be an interesting question and answer for them to hear because clearly it's a massive, massive disappointment when you're missing games of that magnitude. So how do you handle that mentally? Yeah, that's the most difficult thing in football is getting injured um, because one, you're missing games. Two, you feel like you're letting the manager, your teammates and the fans down because you're not out there fighting for the team to win to win games. For me, that's the hardest bit. I feel like I'm letting people down. I feel like I'm um, not pulling my weight or I I'm not helping when I, I could be helping. So for me, that's the hardest bit to deal with. Um, but I think it, it stems from, for me to be able to handle it, it stems from, I suppose, getting overlooked when I was younger, not not getting to play the position that I wanted to or getting the, the praise or the shine that I feel that I could have got. Um, so that, me growing up with that, as, as maybe built my mental strength for. So mm-hmm. I think I can handle most things in football, most disappointments. You kind of just have to just swallow it and and then and then get on with it. I think that's the best way to describe it. And also I I read a lot of psychology books and also worked with psychologists before to kind of to help improve the, um, that side of things as well, which I think is important. What sort of things do you learn from those? Because I find that side of, of, of sport or life in general really fascinating about how you almost compartmentalise things. And, and do you sometimes just have to say, right, that's football. I'm going to just, football's done for the day. I'm going to go and focus on something else and the other things in my life I love. Yeah, that, that's difficult. That's one thing I've been working on because you could have a bad game or a bad session or something might annoy you regarding football. And then the worst thing is to take it back home with you. Um, because one, it's not fair on your family. And two, it, it, it doesn't help getting rid of that feeling in your head. You can't... To, to deal with disappointment and any um, anything regarding psychology is how fast can you park it up in your head and put it back in your head and forget about it. How fast can you get over something? Um, the quicker you can do it, the better you will be. Um, any disappointments, any mistakes, the quicker you can get rid of a disappointment, the better you will be. Did you learn anything about psychology under Marcelo Bielsa? Or, or what is it? What was the biggest thing that you learned un- under him? And how did he develop you? Um, I didn't, no, I didn't develop psychology under him I developed a kind of um, robustness to know you can keep going keep working keep working keep working keep working like a machine you don't really need to rest or take a break you just need to keep working so that's what I learned with him because 
you have to be fit, you have to keep running. You see when Leeds play, that you don't see anyone just walking or jogging. Everyone's a full sprint. They have to sprint to the ball. If the ball gets passed, you need to sprint back into position or sprint with the opposition. So I learned that side of things to know I can push my body even further. Um, and also with, with Bielsa, understanding the game even more, how simple to make the game, um, even down to formations. I bet if you ask a lot of players or fans about formations, explain formations, they won't really know, they won't really know how to break formations down. And I, until working with Bielsa, I didn't know how important different formations were. Um, and he's just working with him. He just made it so clear. And you think, well, this, this is genius. And it, it's probably just simple to him. Kim, I can, I can hear from what you're saying. You're obviously a, 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 a player who goes into every training session with your eyes and ears open, whether it's Appleton, Bielsa, Gerard. I feel as though, from what I'm listening to, you're, you're wanting to soak up all this knowledge and you're, you're, it's so important to you, obviously. Yeah, it's because my main thing in, in football is when I retire, I want to be able to say I've achieved everything I set out to do. I want to be the best player I can possibly be. And to do that, I need to keep improving. And I think the best way to keep improving is by listening to um, my managers, my coaches, um, anybody that can give me some positive advice to improve me. I'm, I'm going to listen. Sometimes it is hard to take criticism. Um, but, but as soon as you can accept it and, and digest it yourself and take what you feel like you need from it, um, to improve you, then I think that's the best thing to do. What did you learn? We've, we've spoken a bit about Vincent Company, the fact that he doesn't like you taking a shot from outside the box. <laughs> um, what did he teach you? With Vincent Company, he taught me a, a lot of things, especially, well, one, I had to learn how to play his style of play, which is similar to Man City's. Um, and that was, that was different to Bielsa's football. So I, I went there, I had to learn the role and the job I had to do within a position. Um, and also tactics. I learned a lot of tactics. So a lot of the days I come out of the meeting of the, the tactical meetings we used to do before training sessions and I'd go back on my phone and write down a lot of the stuff that he's just said because it's, it's so interesting and there's so much knowledge there. One, from, to help my game now and also if I want to be a manager or a coach in the future, I've got it all there and I won't forget about it. Do you want to? Do you think you could go into that? Um, growing up, I'd, I always said I'll never be a coach or never be a manager because I, I don't have the, the patience. <laughs> but maybe it's because I never worked with a manager or a coach that made it more interesting. Like now I'm seeing football and coaching as as a as a um, as a as a how can I explain it as a sum like mathematics um, or a bit of science a, a formula it there's more to it than just just play football uh, one if you if you change a little something over here it'll have a massive effect over there and I find that interesting that's a, that's what you call a student of the game Ali isn't it. Yeah, absolutely, a hundred percent. It's it's great to listen to. Kim, how did you handle the kind of other side of Anderlecht? And by that, I mean a different way of life, a different language, different people. I'm I'm guessing looking at you and listening to you, it's clearly something you embraced. Yeah, for me, I think my my main strength is to be able to adapt quickly to different things, and um, I don't rely on anything or anyone I can kind of just go with the flow but it the off the pitch side of it was difficult because it's not just about me it's about my family how they settle how how they went about their day-to-day -day lives um and for me I found that difficult um it was a very nice place to live out there but for them not not everyone is like me not everyone in my family is like me where they can adapt 
as quickly as me. And I, I had to take that into consideration um, and kind of give more of my energy to help with that side of things. And I thought that was, that was difficult. Um, but now returning back to the UK, myself and my family, we're glad that we've done it because now we don't have any fear of anything, of living in a different country, living in different areas, meeting new people, even down to little things. So if you used to go on holiday, not many people would rent a car and drive in that country because they they might be a bit scared or they've never done it before. Me and my family, we've, we've got no fear with that. We'll just, we'll do it. We could drive it a right hand um, wheel car in a different country or a left hand wheel car in a different country. And just little things like that, because we've been there, done it, it's made us, I don't know, it's improved us or made us stronger, which is good. Yeah. Um, but nothing yeah. prepared you for living in Scotland, though. <laughs> I, 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 I had to make sure I've got my um, my winter coat ready. <laughs> Well, sorry, Ali. <laughs> tell it. Tell us about how that move yeah, happened. Well, listen, <laughs> I, I, you, you don't need to. I, I've been here for most of my life, my friend. I know you can get rain, you can get hailstones and snow in the yeah. one day, mate. I know where you're coming yeah, from. Yeah, I literally every day, every day, I never leave the house without my big coat on. <laughs> like literally them everyone that sees me they must they must think does, does this guy never get changed or does he does he not have another coat but I can't take the risk I, every day I come out of the house I've got my big coat on <laughs> <laughs> so what so what what convinced you to join in, in, in all honesty because I mean, I, I don't need to, you two know better than I do the what what it's like, you know, the, the massive fan base and, and how much Rangers uh, means to, to Glasgow and to not just Glasgow, but Rangers fans all around the world. Who convinced you to join and what was it like? Who convinced me to join? It's an easy one. Same as all the other teams that I've, I've been at. It's the, the club, the size of the club, the fan base, the history and the gaffer. It's, it's those, 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 the combination of those things with a lot of the moves that I've, I've, I've had, Anderlecht, Leeds, Rangers, Oxford. It, it, it's an easy decision for me. And I suppose it's probably silly for me because the last thing I look at is the teammates, the players that they've already got. The, the, the rest of it sells, sells it for me. Come on, I've got to say to you, it's it's and it's only a believe me it's only a small and 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 minor disappointment in what has been a fantastic season, but I can guarantee you one thing, Kemma. See see when those fans get back in that stadium, mm -hmm. you you will absolutely love it. You'll love it like never before. Believe me. Yeah, I can't wait. I can't wait, and I do get reminded every day by the gaffer, by the staff. If I'm in the supermarket next door neighbours anybody I, I see or talk to yeah I, I can't I can't wait for the fans um, and it's such a disappointment this season with what we've done what we've achieved um, the wins that we've had and not being able to do it in front of a full house was it 55,000 and even when you you're, you're on the pitch and you just look off into the stands and you see all those seats you, you, it's incredible. You, you kind of get goosebumps just seeing it, and that's with no fans. So I can only imagine what it's going to be like with the fans. It's relatively simple. You just have to do it all again next season. <laughs> that's all you've got to do. It's quite simple. Yeah, I know exactly. You're right. You're very true. <laughs> it's true. Talk to us about this season then, because to go unbeaten is amazing. And and obviously, at some point, you must have looked at each other and gone. I think we're probably going to do it. Or did you start off going, we've got something special here? Like, you know, how does that work? No, you start off thinking, we've got something going on here. We've got, we've got the players, we've got the staff, we've got the setup. We, we, we can really do something here. And then obviously, you, you take it game by game, you keep getting the three points. 
you keep building. Then you see um, our sec- the second team, the third team, maybe drop some points, but then we get through more, three more points, and it keeps going. But then the, you never ever think throughout the season, yeah, we've got, we've won it here, we've got it. Um, never once. You always, you always kind of fighting. We can't, we can't mess up here. We can't. So we've all, we always have that focus game by game. Um, but then see now that we've won it, you kind of think it it it, it felt a lot easier. But when you're in the moment, you can never think like that. You can never think we're, I don't know, 15 points or 18 points ahead of Celtic. In our heads, we're, we're one point ahead of Celtic because we need to keep winning. But obviously, anybody on the outside looking in, you think, yeah, you, you've won the league already. You're 15 points ahead. It's easy now. But in in the moment, it, it's not. It wasn't. You just tunnel vision. Next game, we need to win it. Looking at it, Kemar, and, and, and it, they sometimes say the the first championship or the first title is the hardest. But I look, I look at Rangers just now. I look at the management and I look at the squad, and I and I think I think Stephen will, will, will strengthen the squad if, if he possibly can. Do you feel that this is just the beginning for this group of players? Yeah, it is. And plus, as soon as we as soon as we won the the league, that's what the gaff, the, the next training session. That's what the gaffer said in the meeting. He said, "This is just the beginning. This is the start." Um, so don't even think about believe, like trying to believe yourself that you, you've done it all or you don't need to, to keep going. This is the start because it's just a, it's the momentum just needs to keep going. We need to keep building. We need to, we need to win the double. We need to win the, the, the treble. We need to go far in U- Europa League. We need to get in the Champions League. We need to go far in the Champions League. So it never ends. Does he still get involved in training? Does he and 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 because I've seen some videos of you know like ex like I watch John Terry sometimes clips of him at Villa training and he's still got it has he has Stephen Gerrard still got it and does he show off sometimes? Um, he he joins in sometimes. So like if a player's gone off injured and we're a man short during training, so he will he might he'll join in, um, or say like a, a spare man at the end of a possession game he'll join in on one or two touch. Um, but yeah, he's, def- he's still got the quality. Um, he's, you know, if you're gonna give him the ball, you know you're gonna he's gonna find you again. Um, is top. I, I, to be fair, I wish he joined him more because even just learning from when playing alongside him, you're gonna learn. And also, when it's a game and he's actually playing properly in the game, you know he's still he's, he, he he will tackle you tough. <laughs> you need you need to be careful because. He's gonna he's gonna leave a, a foot in now and again. I was gonna ask that is he is he still really competitive as well? Yeah, 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 yeah definitely, definitely. And so you, you have to be careful. He's he's got to be better than Gary McAllister. I played with Gary. Gary was my roommate in the national team, right? And I'm watching him in the warm ups. I'm watching him <laughs> on the park in the warm ups. He can't move now. He can't move, man. <laughs> yeah, but and you can tell him I said that as well. <laughs> yeah, but you know what his excuse is? He doesn't need to move it because he's got the technique, he's got the ones, so he doesn't need to move. And, for, and <laughs> I gotta give it him. He 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 joins him. Say like if we're crossing and finishing, um, he he will be the sometimes he will do the, the delivery. He'll cross it in for us, and it's always on the money. Yeah, his, his technique is is still there. Trust me. Tell us a bit because we've spoken about what your reaction was like when when you realised that you won the league and and how weird it was that it's Celtic that you had to kind of wait to see if they beat Dundee or what happened or actually if it was a it's nil nil draw in the end, wasn't it? Which meant you yeah. won. So, what were the celebrations like? And 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 is there anything you can tell us that perhaps didn't make it onto social media? Well, obviously the 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 rules were supposed to be no phones. So obviously, um, obviously a lot of people you can get in trouble doing the slightest thing nowadays with with, with phones. Um, I think even the stuff you did see on social media that definitely shouldn't have got out. So I'm not even sure 
I think whether people are FaceTiming family, family friends, and then the family or friends were screenshotting the FaceTime. It's getting so technical nowadays. <laughs> you literally just have to leave your phone at home to be safe. Um, but no, it, it was it was safe celebrations. It was good, funny celebrations. Um, but I, I think that that moment, a lot of people were in shock. I think their emotions were more shock and um, I don't know, joyful. Like the, the, they can't believe what's happened. Overwhelmed. They can't believe it. Um, and then I think the the following day it was more. We've actually won here. Let's let's really be happy about it. I'm imagining. I'm imagining through experience, Kemar. I'm talking through experience here. I would imagine guys like Alan McGregor <laughs> quite enjoyed the celebration. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to get any secrets out of him, are we? You don't need to. You don't need to. <laughs> you can, you can um, see me at the next game and I can tell you some stories then. <laughs> <laughs> are you looking forward to Champions League football I'll next season? It. Exactly. That's one of my one of my dreams and achievements that I wanted I want to do in football. One of them was Europa League football. Hence why I, I moved to Anderlecht to hopefully play in the Europa League whatever happened with that season and Corona and everything then I ended up moving to Rangers then I was able to play Europa League football and we've had a good run at it this season so I'm I'm happy with that and now Champions League another thing on my bucket list that I, I want to do I want like I said when I retire I want to say um, and and tell myself, well, I've, I've played Champions League here. But also, mm. playing Champions League, I don't want to just make the numbers up. I want to win games. I want to score goals. I want to look good in Champions League. Well, I'll tell you something, Kemar. I, I'm, I'm, I'm so hopeful <clears throat> that next season, and I know it's going to happen, mate, Champions League, those those special nights, Tuesday and Wednesday at Ibrook Stadium, 50-odd thousand folk in, mate. It will be, in, I can guarantee you, Kemar, it'll be an experience you'll look forward to and you'll remember for the rest of your life. It'll be it'll be wonderful, mate. And you all deserve it, I'll tell you that. Yeah, I can't wait. And also, when I was signing for Rangers, I remember somebody telling me, you just wait for those, I don't know, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday nights when you're walking out to the, the music, the Champions League music or the Europa League music. You, you yeah. just wait and... It happened, we was walking out, even though it was an empty stadium, but the Europa League music was playing. And that feeling, I always keep saying that feeling, I can't explain that feeling. It, it, it's something I'll, ne- I'll never forget. It, 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 gets, you, it gets you going. It, 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 it's like, it makes you addictive. You, you, wanna, you want more. You want to do it again. What else is on that bucket list? Because um, obviously the pinnacle of everyone's game is is to play for their country. Yeah. Do, you, do you feel like that's within reach? I hope so, yeah. I'm going to keep working towards that. I'm, I see um, my fellow ex-Leeds players and they're getting yeah. spoken about with, with, with England, which is, is, is so, so good. Because I remember as having conversations many years ago about if ever we was to play for England or um, the current England squad, this and that. And a few of the boys now have been able to uh, get close. Calvin Phillips is there. There's other boys there now getting spoken about. And There's it's calls for Bamford yeah. as well, weren't yeah. there? Yeah, and it's, it's, a, it's amazing to, to to witness it, to see it. And these sort of players deserve it because we, they put the work in. So, And I'm not surprised it, it's, it's happening either. Um and hopefully I can I can do the same as well. It must be. I'm thinking, I'm, I, and, and Laura's asking you on the bucket list. You've just about. I would imagine you've just about covered everything there in terms of you've got to. You can never ever give up in, in your international dreams and aspirations, Kemar. That's obvious. And clearly, this season has given you a taste for success. You yeah. know, which will hopefully continue at Rangers for, for a long, long time. I really. 
I really, I, I can't tell you. And and would you would you back me up? It's such a thrill for me to have, have a chat with you because I, I've been ecstatic for the last ten days, mate. Like, <laughs> like you've no idea. And I, I and I just want. And on behalf of all the Rangers fans, I spoke to I spoke to Davo and I spoke to Griggsy, but I just want to thank you and Tab and and all the boys for what you've given us this season, my friend. Thank you, thank you. It means a lot, especially coming from yourself and. And as players, we feed off that energy and the knowledge of how important it is to the fans and even to the ex-players, everybody that's part of Rangers. It, it's, it's a massive achievement that we've been able to do. Come on, it's just been great having you on. Thank you so much. And and so interesting as well to hear um, the way that you come back from knockbacks and, and the, the way that you learn about football and all those interesting things that you find um, has been brilliant for us. So thank you so much for coming on and good luck for the rest of the season. Good luck for Champions League football next season as well. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. It's been a you pleasure. You get a double, mate. Yes, I yeah, know. We have to. We need to. So there we have it. Kem Arif, what a brilliant guest, Ali. How interesting was that? It was everything I thought it would be, to be honest with you, would you? He was magic. And it was it was fascinating because <clears throat> you didn't realise, and I didn't know beforehand, you know, the, the places he'd been in loan at, at such a young lad. And, and, and the, you know, the chances he took, the gambles he took to, to, to get his career, you know, moving, going to Leeds United, and then another, a real opportunity to go to Anderlecht in Belgium. It's still, you know, a relatively young age. And then, Back to Glasgow. No, and he, he, as I said, it was it was great to get an insight, not just to hear about the goals, but to see how he handles injuries. He's different managers, Appleton, Bielsa, Gerrard. Yeah, I really, I knew I would enjoy it, and boy, did I. It was wonderful having you on. It was a real treat for me, um, especially. Um, Bio, we think we'll be back next week, but if not, are you free, Ali? <laughs> I'm free. I said, is that John Inman? I used to say that. I'm, I'm showing my age again. Oh, no. I'm free. You are. <laughs> I'm just going to go off on Google who that is. Um, Ali, pleasure. Thank you so much for stepping in. Um, come back anytime. We love having you on. And uh, I'll see you in the morning on TalkSport Breakfast. Will do. Thanks for having me. So that was the wonderful Ali McCoy. Uh, just a reminder as well, um, Super Sick Round is free to play again. Go onto the website, go onto the app. Don't miss out just because it's international break. You can still play. You don't want to miss out on a chance of winning the jackpot. £250,000 as always this week. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Give us a follow on Twitter and Instagram as well, at Super Six, and we will see you again next week. Super Sick.